Welcome to my AP Chemistry course. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're going to be continuing AP Chemistry and, and learning about reactions in solution by looking at oxidation reduction reactions in this series of videos. Now, in the last lesson, our focus was primarily on precipitation reactions. This is where we had charged ions that are moving around in solution and that were attracted to each other, and they formed a solid precipitate. So let me show you what we had. We might have had a reaction like this here, where we had lead two ions, and they were reacted with chloride ions, and you made lead two chloride. Of course, when you balance it, it looks like this. So in the solution, we had these lead ions and some chloride ions swimming around. They were both already charged. Lead had a plus two charge, and the chlorides were both negative one apiece and they were swimming around in solution, they would find each other like this, and then they would form a precipitate. And so these uh, electrostatic attractions would be formed there, and they would uh, be pulling toward each other, and they would, uh, of course, this is part of a larger crystal that, that would eventually have a high enough density that it would precipitate out of solution, out of solution and you'd actually see this uh, solid form. Now notice, in this case, the charges were not changing, which means electrons were not transferred. So in the uh, reactant side of this, lead was a plus two, as you can see right here. Chloride was a minus one, as we can see here. And guess what? The charges were the same on the product side. So this is a very typical of reactions that take place in solution where we're making a solid precipitate. Well, starting in this reaction, or in this lesson rather, we're going to be learning about how electrons can actually be transferred through the process of the reaction. So here's how that might take place. Here's an example where we have calcium metal that's reacting with solid sulfur to make calcium sulfide. Now, what might happen is we'll have some calcium atoms, and of course calcium has two valence electrons, and here we have a sulfur atom, which has six valence electrons. And we're familiar with the octet rule that they would uh, be more stable with eight. And so calcium is actually going to donate two electrons over here to sulfur. And so when that happens, well, calcium has lost those electrons. And so it's a, a, a cation. It's got a positive charge. It's a little bit smaller, as you can see. And sulfur has gained these electrons. And so it's a it's an anion. It's got a negative charge. It's a little bit bigger, as we can see. And now they have this electrostatic attraction. And guess what? They're attracted to each other just like that. And so they're able to make a compound. Well, I want you to notice that there was an actual transfer of electrons here. The calcium lost electrons. It lost electrons. We say that when something loses electrons, it is oxidized. On the other hand, sulfur gained electrons, so we can say that it was reduced. Losing electrons means it's oxidized. Gaining electrons means it's reduced. Now, there are some students that have a little trouble keeping that straight. There's another way that we can think about this reaction. Let's think about it in a different way. Same reaction. We have the calcium that started out as a neutral atom. It had a charge of zero, as all, as all uh, elements in their most natural state do. And guess what? The sulfur was the same way. All elements in their most natural state have a charge of zero. Well, when they undergo that ionization, calcium gave electrons to sulfur, well, guess what? Calcium is no longer neutral. It's got a plus two charge and the sulfur became a negatively charged anion. It had a negative two charge. So guess what? When something, we have that reaction again. So when the charge of something goes up, we say that it's oxidized. That's another way to think about oxidation. And when the charge of something goes down, we call that reduction. So for some students, that makes more sense. When the charge goes from, as you can see here, zero to plus two. Charge going up is oxidation. 
We went from zero to minus two. Charge going down is reduction. So that's how that works. Now, oxidation reductions or uh, reactions, or as we like to call them redox, because that's a whole lot shorter. This is where we have an element that's being oxidized, and another and another element is being reduced. You have to have both of those in order to have a redox. You can't have two two elements that are being oxidized. You can't have an ox-ox. It doesn't work that way. And you can't have uh, two elements that are being reduced without something being oxidized. You can't have a red-red. Have to have a, have, have a reduction, have to have an oxidation at the same time. Redox. If you have trouble remembering that, this mnemonic aid might help you. Leo the lion goes grr. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, it tells us that losing electrons is oxidation. So that's the Leo part of this. And then the GER is that gaining electrons is reduction. So that's the other part of this. Or if you don't like that, you can think of oil rig, which means oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. So some students use that to remember uh, how to keep oxidation and reduction straight in their minds. Now, when we think of redox, probably, probably the most classic examples that come to mind are the ones that we in first year chemistry called single replacement reactions. So these are those reactions where you're taking a metal and reacting it with metal ions or some sort of a compound that has metal or positive ions in it. That's probably our go-to set of examples for redox, but those aren't the only ones. You know, synthesis reactions can be redox, like in the last example we had calcium and sulfur combining in a synthesis reaction to make calcium sulfide. That was, that was redox. Decomposition reactions sometimes can be redox. Even combustion reactions can be redox. And so redox covers a very wide range of reactions in the, the field of chemistry. So let's take a look at an example here. Like I said, the most common redox reactions involve a metal added to a metal ion. So here's an example of that. Magnesium metal is added to a solution of zinc chloride. Well, magnesium metal is just Mg, isn't it? And then zinc chloride would be a mixture of Zn, 2 plus, and Cl, negative. Now, in this reaction, it's redox, so we know it's a metal reacting with the metal ion. So what is that chloride doing there? Well, the answer is it's not really doing much of anything. It's what we called a spectator ion. Spectator ions are just sitting there. They aren't actually participating like spectators at a ball game. They're just there. They actually aren't out on the field playing. So that chloride is not going to be included in the overall net ionic equation. Well, magnesium, it's a metal, and so metals are usually oxidized. And it's going to oxidize into whatever ion magne magnesium usually forms, which has got a plus 2 charge, if you will recall, by looking at the periodic table. So magnesium 2 plus is one of the products. And then zinc 2 plus, it's going to be reduced down to usually whatever, uh, whatever element or whatever uh, neutral version of that element is, which is just zinc, Zn. And so here we have something being oxidized. The magnesium is oxidized, and the zinc ions end up being reduced. So we have that there. Whenever we write the overall balanced equation, it's always good to put in the states in there. So magnesium is a solid. It's added to zinc 2 plus, which is aqueous. And we get magnesium 2 plus ions, which are aqueous, and then plain old zinc metal, which is a solid. So, once again, notice metals are usually oxidized, metal ions are usually reduced. Now, in this example that we just did, it's usually pretty easy to tell the charge of the atoms and the ions here. We know just by looking that that is a plus 2 because it says so. And that's a minus 1 because it says so. And that's a plus 2 because it just comes right out and, and says so. In some compounds and ions, it's a little harder to determine what the charge is or, or the oxidation state of each element. So in the next video, we're going to learn a very specific systematic way 
to figure out the charge, or as we often call it, the oxidation state of any element in any compound or ion. So I want you to join me for that video next time. Uh, I'm Jeremy Krug, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you learned something here about redox, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so that you won't miss a thing. I want you to get a five on your AP exam, and I want you to join me again in this complete AP chemistry course where we can learn some more chemistry, some more chemistry together.